So I just want to welcome everybody. It's awesome to see all the faces that were in the hot, steaming entryway at our last board meeting and upstairs in the boardroom. This meeting is entirely thanks to you guys speaking up and saying, hey, we want an opportunity to have a different kind of engagement, bringing that information to our board who are here, our superintendent, assistant superintendent, deputy superintendent, and making it happen. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for that. It's huge. So thank you for being here. So as you know, this is our very first board leadership listening session. So you guys said you would come. You did. Thank you for filling the room. I know people are still trickling in. If you, a little housekeeping, if you want to speak and you haven't signed up, you can kind of give me a head nod. Alandra is in the back with her hand up. And we've had a few people who are not going to be able to speak tonight. We've got a few people um, that are going to cover for the merits if they don't show up. So whoever is going to do that, just be on standby. And I think we have Alandra a few more spots we could fill. OK, cool. So if anybody wants to jump back there, go right ahead. So you guys, I think, are aware that the goal of these events is to really create a chance to connect with our board members. So it's a broader level. If you didn't know our school board meetings, which you probably kind of figured out, the intent of a school board meeting, a business meeting, is to have folks come and present um, public comment on the agenda items for the most part. And so this time, it's just wide open. Whatever you guys want to talk about, you go right ahead, share that with the board. We have Superintendent Steve Cook, Dr. Steve Cook, right here, sitting next to Deputy Dr. Deputy, well, I guess you're deputy first, then doctor. Deputy Dr. Laura Nordquist, deputy superintendent. Laura is going to be taking notes tonight. And then all of our board members. So we have, let's do some quick introductions. So we're going to have Melissa. Do you want to say hi? Hello, everybody. Yeah, Marcus. So ch your board chair and your vice chair. And then we have Shamiko, school board member, up here in the front. Yannette. Thank you. And Shirley. Thank you. So you got five of our board members here. The goal will be that they're going to bring information back. They will process the information that is um, shared here. Our, our board chairs and chair and vice chair help to build our future agendas with Dr. Cook. So the information you share here, you could one day see that coming up on a, a future agenda. So thank you for sharing. I know we have a ton of, we have a ton of different topics that people are bringing up. All right, so let's just review a few of our key guidelines. So it's a listening session. So that means our board members are primarily here to listen. There's not going to be a ton of engagement. Some of that is to help kind of keep this moving. I think we have over 50 people signed up to speak. So we're going to do two minutes each. There's going to be, Janet, can you show us what the bell looks like? A timer. I'm going to give you guys a hand signal when you're getting close, like around 30 seconds. I'll give you an audible at five seconds. Um, it's our understanding that the sound on the end of this might be really awful, so we'll adjust that. So Wendy, sorry. Wendy's first. <laughs> so if that's terrible and real loud, we're going to try to adjust that for you. OK, it works. You guys get the point. We're done. Yeah, sounds like an end of a basketball game. Um, OK, so. Um, we're just going through here. Okay, housekeeping. Water, snacks, tons and tons of Tillamook cheese in the back, if you, for whatever reason. Um, yep, thanks to Nutrition Services. If you need the restrooms or you want to fill a water bottle, if you go out that back door, take a right. There are the junior bathrooms that don't have doors. There's not a lot of audible privacy, the kid bathrooms on each side. And then on the right side of the bottle fill station is a single stall bathroom. So just kind of depending how you feel about or how tall you want to be in there. So let's see, masks. So I think everyone knows that the state has now recommended masking indoors. So if you want a mask, they're in the back. Um, another just little plug on that. Well, let me tell you a quick thing. So we know some of the people here at reached out and they were concerned about masking. So you're deaf on both sides, actually. So you're definitely welcome to wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask either. Some of our board members, myself, are going to be doing different things. We have board members and um, staff and probably some community members that have immunocompromised family members. So just hopefully we can honor that. Let's see what we got here. Oh, and if you guys, did everyone 
see what the governor put out today? Can I just see hands? I'm just curious like how fast this stuff flies around. Okay, so for those that didn't see that, um, the governor has directed the health authority and the Department of Education to implement a rule which would require masking of all students and staff indoor in our schools. So that's out there. We're processing it, so stay tuned for more, okay? So that's where that's at. We will follow the order if it's a rule. There, it is a rule, so we will follow that. So, Okay, process for speakers. The, we're gonna call the speakers up. I will call them up in the order that they signed up. Again, the, two, the merits aren't here, so just be ready for a little mix there. And I will also let you guys know who's on deck, but I think you can follow along by your numbers. Everybody knows what your number is-ish? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, there's not a last chance to speak, but if you decide you wanna speak, we'll have everybody speak once, but you decide there's something you wanna talk about and you haven't signed up, feel free. Okay, we got two hours. We're gonna try to do this in two hours, so I gotta wrap it up. And if more people sign up tonight than we have time for, we're gonna put you on a list and we're gonna call you to see if you wanna speak at the next one. We'll get you at the top, okay? So if, if we end up running out of time, sign up back there with Alandra. Let's see, two minutes. Um, an effective approach, I'm sure you all know this, but we're gonna do a little bit of the, the Robert's rules. So an effective approach is to lead with your key point or concern and then explain the reasons for it, right? Um, if others have already expressed your views, and you decide that I don't know if I really want to speak, I would still encourage you to come up and say, hey, I just want to say I, I echo everything that these two ladies in the blue said, right? So you can do that. State your name, so we have that. And if appropriate, you guys can send a spokesperson. I think we already know all that good stuff. Okay, you're going to see the countdown. I'm going to keep you posted there. Now, I know that we had some a little pushback on this, so with all of the people that... Um, signed up to speak, we asked them to follow some rules, right? And those rules would apply for all of us so that we can keep this moving along. And those rules are, let me see if we can read these here. So, no insults, okay? We can do that, right? If you wanna insult me, let's do it out here after. Totally fine, but don't do it in here, okay? No obscenity, no profanity, no threats, um, no discriminatory comments, no attacks against any person. If you don't like my shirt, you could say, sometimes people that are standing up front wear shirts that look like blah, blah, blah. But let's not get direct and say Julianne's shirt. So those are easy. Now here's a big key of this. It, if conversations get heated, um, I'm gonna shut it down, right? So we have got to be able to be here and feel safe. There's, uh, someone actually reached out to me today and was like, what do I do if you know, if it gets kind of ugly, and I was like, it won't. Like, we're all here, right, together. So we'll take a five-minute break if we need it, if we get rowdy. We'll let ourselves settle down. We'll eat cheese and have water. We'll come back, and if we do it again, we're done, right? Easy peasy, right? So those are the rules. Um, clapping is a, is a challenging thing because when we start doing a lot of clapping, we start extending the meeting. We start kind of clapping over people. So let's try our best to resist the impulse to clap. So just do your best, okay? All right, let's see here. All right, you guys are awesome. Everybody's very like, kind of like look like you're ready to go. So on that note, let's keep things light. Let's have fun, share your passions. I think we have lots of mom and dad bears in this audience. We all care about kids and we have lots of different opinions about how to kind of move forward. So thank you for being here. I'm gonna hand it over yeah. to Melissa and Marcus. And um, last thing, just a reminder that Joel's in the back. For those, if you would like Spanish translation, it's Carly, it's Carly, Kayla. I like how she just says, yes, whatever. I'm trying to work. So thank you for being here. We're gonna kick it off and away we go. Great, thank you so much for that, Julianne. Um, we tried to make this a little bit more casual, but I'm realizing it means I'm not looking at you while I'm speaking into the mic, so I apologize for that. I'll try and adjust. Um, but we just really wanted, on behalf of Marcus and myself, really wanted to thank you for coming out tonight. Um, you're taking time away from your families. You're taking time away from enjoying the beautiful Central Oregon nights. Um, you're taking time away from watching the Olympics or, um, as my family are doing right now, the Bend Elks. 
Um, and so we just really want to honor and um, let you know that we respect you taking the time tonight to share your thoughts with us. Um, these thoughts um, and, your value, and your voices are valued. And what we hear from you tonight will continue to inform our work. It'll inform what we're thinking about. It'll inform our discussions with our superintendent. It'll inform our future agendas and it'll inform um, how we make sure we're communicating effectively with, with our community, so thank you. Um, I want to emphasize that this is not the only opportunity. And so we absolutely, as Julianne said, heard that we needed more opportunities and we are creating them and we are committed to that. Um, in addition to this listening session, there will be another one in South County. In addition to that, we are always available. Um, we read every email that's sent to us, and so I really encourage people to send emails if they haven't, um, to make sure that the board hears your voice. Um, and also that many of us meet one-on-one -on -one with people, either by phone, in person. Um, and so just know that this isn't the only opportunity, it's one of many opportunities um, to have your voice heard. We are really um, committed to doing that. And again, we thank you for coming out tonight, being here and sharing your voice. And so Julianne, let's right. get started. All right, Wendy, you're up. Um, a couple of other things. <laughs> we are attempting to record this podcast style. So we will push something out, um, probably, where's Alandra? We'll push something out, social media maybe, so that everyone has a chance to get it. And then we have some key communicators in the group. So we'll get it to you guys too when we're done. And that is it, take it away, Wendy. You wanna check your mic? Testing. Oh, it's perfect, thank you. My name is Wendy Immel. Come closer. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay. I'm gonna give you those seconds back. Okay. Okay, okay. Go okay. For it. okay. I am a mother of two children in Ben Lapine schools. I am a college professor with more than 16 years of experience in education. I am a medical manager where I have managed to keep my entire staff safe throughout this pandemic. I am a widow of a Marine who gave his life so that you guys can sit here in an elected position and serve the people. I reiterate, serve the people. We are the people that you serve. My question to you is why must we as parents fight for transparency and accountability from this board? For going on two months, I have been asking for a copy of my children's curriculum. I have been ignored, put off, and placated. I have yet to receive a copy of the reading lists, supplemental material, SEL curriculum, and sexualized education materials that I have been requesting. Why is that? Redmond and Crook County and many other districts have announced optional masks for students returning to the school, including following Kate Brown's announcement today. Crook County reaffirmed optional masks. Why is it that this board continues to put off parent questions regarding masking rules this fall? Why is it that this board of public servants refuses to include parent opinion and preference in this decision? Other districts have conducted a parent survey to factor into their decision-making process. The lack of consideration of your constituent opinions and views is short-sighted. At this time, I am calling for transparency and accountability. I am asking you to do better. Do your job. Serve our children and our families. Sadly, I do not expect an answer to my questions because you have set a precedent for simply dismissing our statements and questions, and that is a grave disappointment. That is not service, that is disservice. 15. I will close with, I hope you take the time to consider how it looks to the community and all here when you listen to our questions and remain silent. Thanks, Wendy. Ms. Emil. Do, you want me to, do you want me to give that to Laura? Ms. Immel, I got a question for you. Okay. Um, Being that you're a professor of ethics, do you think it's ethical the way you have harassed our board? Wait, let's, um, <laughs> let's not, let's not, okay, so you guys, all right, you guys, all right, yeah. Thank you. You guys, listen, you guys, here's what we're gonna do. Here is what, everyone, we were only through one person, Marcus, Melissa, board members, staff, we are going to, John, thank you. Let me just make a statement. We are not going to speak, Marcus. You guys, okay, that's, this is your warning. We are going to get it, you guys, yes. I just gave him his warning. All right, you guys. 
Yes. I was not harassing any of you. So you guys, you. here, will you stand with me? Listen, no. you, You're you don't have to. to you guys, listen, this is, you guys, this is not funny. It's not okay. We are going to finish it right now. That is it not is going to, him. listen, no. I'm going to apologize. Yes, I'm going to apologize that we, here's what I'm apologizing for. We have, but listen, you guys, if we can't do this, and that is all of us, all of us, all of us, then we're going to all go. And I want to hear from all of you because I just asked him, okay, all right, that's your first, that's our first break. Five minutes, grab some water. Thanks. Thanks. I will talk. We'll see if we can get this back in order. I would love for us to get this. We've got to be able to talk to each other. Yes. This is not going to go anywhere. We exactly. can't get a conversation. Exactly. Mr. Cook, I'm running the town hall. I actually can, ran can for I, the board. Maria? And Maria Gallantella ran for the board. Yes. 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 It's hard. I was up in the second half. Okay. I understand. I
commercial break. And I just want to apologize for not being able to kind of get us stabilized, but I think we're good. Marcus would like to say a few words. And then if we can all keep going forward a path of success and togetherness, even though we're not, we're divided on some things, then we will stay. If we can't, it's totally fine. We'll go. Okay. So. Hold on, guys. Well, I'm you, gonna, we, I'm everyone say can this make really their quick. own decisions. Go ahead. I'm a dad. And I'm an educator and I'm so many things. But today, and you can look for it all you want, someone went on Facebook or in other social medias and said something about my family today. And I'm gonna tell you something right now, that's the one thing that's near and dear to my heart. When you go after my daughter, when you go after my daughter, no, no, yes, somebody said something about my daughter today. She's a beautiful young lady. If you do not mess with that late young lady, so you could be upset, I understand, but you do not say something about my family. Are we clear? No, 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 guys, no, no, him, no, 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 I seen it. He's so, not, he's just saying in general, someone in general, says something. Please, please, guys. someone says something derogatory about my daughter today, and I, and I really, really, really do not understand. So, thank you. So, that being said, we're gonna continue but please do me a big favor and I will do the same thing and I will have thick skin, but here's the thing, please do not say anything about my family. Okay. No, it, you guys, thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. And he is, let's just be clear, you guys, let's be clear that when we all come into an environment of any kind to work with family, we bring things with us that are impactful. And so I, I would just like to honor that and thank everyone for still being here. If you don't want to stay, I understand. We are going to stay, and I know that we're gonna get through this together, and I'm gonna call up our second speaker. All right, we're doing it. All right, Kathy Denfeld. Hi, um, my name is Kathy Denfeld, and um, I have, um, I'm a, I'm a former student um, from way back when at the Ben Lapine School District, um, and I have now have the privilege of having four of my own children who are currently um, enrolled at the Ben International School and Realms High School. Um, before the governor's announcement today, my intention was to come here and to um, discuss the mitigation efforts um, of, for the upcoming school year. Um, I had wanted to acknowledge the great diversity of opinion around how best to keep our children healthy and safe in the upcoming school year, and to validate the very difficult, um, excuse me, um, role that the school board and all the school employees have had throughout the pandemic. I appreciate your desire to keep as many families in school as possible, and I know that um, listening to us while weighing the newest information by the public health and, about public health and best practices um, is a balancing act. Um, as it was said in the last school board meeting, this is outside of your guys' area of expertise, and you guys have a moral obligation to consult with people who's, um, who are experts in the field. Um, I thank you for naming that. Um, and as I close, I just want to um, take the opportunity to congratulate and welcome the newest school member board, uh, the newest members of the school board. Um, and thank you for making yourself available after getting the feedback that you got, um, as, as well as through the campaign. Um, I really appreciated that as well. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Jennifer Jennings and then Douglas Merrill. Jennifer. I'm a parent, Jennifer Jennings. I'm also um, sharing this with another parent who could not be here, who in Tran. Um, we were going to talk about masks, how our families have done everything we can as responsible community members to protect our families and protect our community. And with our youngest still not being able to be vaccinated, we encourage the district to please follow the governor's suggestions. We are also asking the district to commit to true ethnic studies. I went from kindergarten to high school in this district. 
It wasn't until my 30s that I actually learned true history about African American history, indigenous history, Latinx history, and our Asian American history. Our children today need to learn that. We must also commit to teaching our children about race, racism, and how to be anti-racist. With any human growth, there has to be levels of uncomfortableness and pressure. This is when we know we are on the right path. If we are to model our kids on growth mindset, we must to practice a growth mindset. It's not easy, but that's how we improve as a human race. Again, I want to thank our school board and our school district last spring, how you guys got our kids back in school, although I did not send my kids. But you proved that kids can be resilient and they can wear masks and they can do this. And please know that bullying is not okay. And people who bully are the same people who are bullying our children because their children are bullying. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna make a sign offer. If anybody has signs that they want me to put up here, I will gladly put your signs up. If you, that would be helpful, feel free. You wanna put, I'll take it, yep. Okay, while we're doing that, is Doug here, Douglas Merrill. Thanks. Hey there. Thank you. Which side, that one? Okay, cool. Hi there. Hey. Thanks, Scott. It goes I was on that. Gonna... Side. We love it. You can give them to Deputy Superintendent Norquist, please. If anybody else, um, as you're speaking, if you want to email your comments or your chicken scratches or fully uh, fleshed out content, you can send that to us. Let me just know. I'll let you know where to send it. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. I'm here uh, personally because I want to be, but also. I am the Chief Medical Officer for Bend and Redmond uh, Hospitals, and I'm representing and uh, speaking on behalf of St. Charles. Uh, I will start with saying I'm very glad that uh, Governor Brown has made the decision for you, I think, because I know you already deal with a lot of difficult situations. I did want to let you know that St. Charles leaders and our providers strongly support the decision to mask uh, children who have not been vaccinated. Here's why. The Delta variant of COVID-19 is increasing in our communities. Over the past several weeks, the state of Oregon has increased from 5% to now 50% of this more transmissible variant of the virus. If you remember nothing else I say tonight, please remember this. Patients infected with the Delta variant have 1,000%, 1,000% more virus particles in them than did patients who had the original virus. It is very, very infectious. Our current vaccination rate in Deschutes County is not high enough to provide herd immunity against the Delta variant or any variant. It spreads too easily now, <clears throat> and we are seeing a new spike in cases. The patients are younger, on average, than they were a few months ago. This variant is tough on all ages. The four hospitals at St. Charles have become emergency only hospitals 30. in the past several months. The patients of our community now cannot get elective surgery because we have no beds. When I say that, you might think of elective surgery as no big deal, but that includes heart surgery. You can't have it right now. This is a public health emergency. The decision to wear a mask by all of us will make a very big difference in how bad this pandemic will be in our community and how long it will last. Thank you. Thank you. Nope. Forget it, you guys. We're trying not to clap, remember? Thank you very much for that. It's helpful. All right. Um, Nicole Moore Peru Perulo. Nicole, are you here? Okay. Scott Stewart and then John Hafner. Scott. Did you bring toilet paper? Okay. <laughs> Right, you got two minutes, I'll hold your props. All right, you just let me know how you want your props. All right, we'll play along. All right, we're starting it, John. What? All right. I don't think we're gonna, this is probably not gonna go well for me. All right. 
All right, Scott, bring it on. You got two minutes. Let me put my phone Just Scott, you were on deck. Okay. Okay, thanks, Scott. All right. So all of you have taken the uh, oath of office to support the Oregon and U.S. Constitution. These are the highest laws of the land. There is no pandemic clause in the Constitution. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution, no state shall make or enforce any law to deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property. Article 1, Section 20 of the Oregon Constitution, no law shall be passed granting to any citizen or class of citizens privileges or immunities which upon the same term shall not equally belong to all citizens, masked versus unmasked, vaxxed versus non-vaxxed. Article 1, Section 22, the operation of the law shall never be suspended except by the authority of the Legislative Assembly. Can you as a board show that legislative uh, authority? Can anybody? All right, she's been going on and on, unlimited, infinite timelines, and every emergency power has a two-month timeline. Why are we still wearing masks and why is this vax thing going on? All right, statute 659A or 659850, discrimination in education prohibited based on religious conscious and medical disabilities. ORS 339288 prohibits the use of certain restraints, specifically any, any restraint that impedes or creates a risk of impeding breathing. <laughs> ORS 163.275. A, a person commits the crime of coercion, pay attention, board, when the person compels or induces another person to engage in conduct from which the other person has a legal right to abstain. 30. And they do so by means of instilling fear. And it's unfortunate I have to skip this because I used to insure a lot of school districts. And I got those school districts because they trusted me to handle their risk, no, to no contract law, to no state law. Okay, insurance contracts are unilateral, unilateral contracts. The I state of Oregon protects school boards for negligence. It does not for gross negligence. Gross negligence is defined as board decisions or indecisions that knowingly may cause physical and or financial injury to third parties. Your only protection is via directors and officers liability insurance. Perfect. Since the state of Oregon holds school boards, I got Scott. one sentence left. Okay, finish it and then we'll give me this. Since the state of Oregon holds school boards jointly and severally liable, as well as their personal assets, I encourage you to either increase your current liability limits or honor your oath of office and protect these stakeholders' constitutional Thank liberties. You. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. you guys. All right, you guys, that's enough. Thank you for the applause. Thank you. John Hafner, you want to step closer? Because you're a little taller than the mic. There you go. Hi, I'm John Hafner. My daughter right here goes to Cass, or excuse me, Pacific Crest Middle School. Today was a sad day as I learned more families are leaving the district or the state. Once again, our kids' education and well-being are on the chopping block as masks are now back in fashion, according to our overlords. And if history is an indicator, you will blindly follow your excuse. The CDC, OEA, ODE, NEA said so. A recent quote from the respected Senator Ted Cruz, and I quote, a year and a half ago, the CDC was one of the most respected scientific organizations in the world and they allowed themselves to be politicized with high priest Dr. Fauci at the helm, and right now their credibility is in tatters. But here in Oregon, who are the people pulling the strings in Salem? Big Pharma and unions are the two biggest lobbies. Here are some other numbers. In the first three months of this year, Pfizer sold $3.5 billion worth of vaccines at a 20% profit. And folks, they still have more profits to make, and masks are a daily reminder you need to be afraid. I think it's critical for you to recognize we are not ignorant parents. Most of us have dedicated hundreds of hours learning the hell out of this issue. We are the ones using true science rather than just opinions. It is the height of arrogance to think we are uninformed parents simply because we are not immunologists. If you choose to side with the politically biased experts, you will be facing a multi-pronged attack involving litigation, civil disobedience, loud protests, and more. You have already forced a thousand families to leave the district. Do you want to lose another thousand? If you give a damn about families, you will not only hear us, but represent us. Keep masks off our kids, because my daughter's not wearing one. She already wore one last year, running cross country using your best science. You've had enough. No more masks. Thanks, John. <laughs> Guys, you want, me to, you want me to put that up here? Thanks. Sure. Thanks. All right. 
Thank you, John. Allison and then Eddie or Edie. Allison Utterback. Allison, are you coming up? No? Okay. I'd like to introduce our second amazing ASL interpreter. What's your name? Aaron. This is Aaron. All right, thanks. All right, Aaron Craig. No, I see people sitting up so straight. Is that just to look around? Because I think you're going to stand. Yeah. Do we miss you? Are you Lindsay Lyon? Would you like to go now? All right. All right, Lindsay Lyon. Sorry about that. We skipped five, sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Lindsay Lyon, and I'm a teacher and a parent of two kids in the district. I have 16 years of teaching experience. Last year, I taught at Skyline High School. I loved it. I loved my parents, my students, the community. I did not love teaching online. In August 2020, I started communicating. I started writing emails. I started calling about my desire to do my job, which was teaching in person. We started in September. It didn't work out that well. I was confused about why I had to advocate for this, but I carried on. And the, the answers I got from the board, from the superintendent, were all the same. It's not us. It's the metrics. It's Kate Brown. My message initially tonight was going to use that example to address the leeway that we had prior to today to be pro-choice when it comes to masking our kids. I thought we could be in a position as a district to make our own guidelines, which would be inclusive of diverse perspectives. We've heard various perspectives on this issue tonight, based on trusting parents as the experts that we are regarding our kids and their health. Now, in light of Kate Brown's newest directives, here we are again. It's a big one, it's not going away. So what now? Well, you're holding this session and I applaud you for that and I appreciate you listening to us as parents. It's a good thing. Many of us have not felt heard. Yesterday, I got to meet with Melissa, got to know her a bit. We brainstormed some possible solutions that were maybe, maybe we could come together on this issue. I ask that you continue to seek our input, that you respond to us as educated parents. Thank you. Thank you, you Lindsay. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Are we to Edie? Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you to your right, left-hand lady there for getting my attention. All right, you have the mic. Thank you. Good you evening, uh, Ben Lapine School Board members. I'm Edie Zorzicki. I respectfully request that you provide every child with the following, a well-rounded, equal education, the opportunity to genuinely be valued and heard when learning in the class and when seeking help, advice, or support of any kind from school employees. I also request that you adopt practices that lead to the recruitment, hiring, and retention of a workforce that reflects the, our diverse communities and nation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, Tim Hellman and then Amanda McDermott is on deck. I'm gonna try to keep track this time. Thanks, Tim. And I'll just, uh, so process, when I see you guys looking at the clock, I'm not gonna say anything until we get to five seconds. But if I don't see you, I'll give you a 30 and then a five or somewhere in the middle. Go ahead. Thank you to the board for this chance to be heard and for your tireless engagement with the community. While I do not speak for the overwhelming majority of voters who elected you, I do speak as one of them. There are times a minority of raucous voices may muddy the broader context, may reduce complex issues to a pro or con litmus test. While they have the right to be heard and considered, that consideration should never distort the underlying values that our school district must uphold. I value an education for my two sons that openly explores the way racism has functioned in our society, that examines a history without the uncomfortable edges and regrettable moments sanded away and covered in the thin coat of patriotic fervor. 
A history book that disallows history is nothing more than sanctioned propaganda. I value truth, and I strongly reject the suggestion that momentary discomfort when encountering historical facts should silence the lived experience of students pushed to the margins and disregarded. I value an educational context where my sons learn that all our lives are deeply interconnected, and that even when they aren't personally at elevated risk, public health measures may require their involvement. I want them to understand that they are each a thread in the fabric of this school district, this community, this nation. What gravely damages our children aren't discussions of racism or wearing masks. What harms them is an incomplete definition of freedom that ignores responsibility and accountability. What also hurts them is the modeling that desired outcomes only require vocally confronting decision makers while ignoring the work that must be done in the trenches. Work, work that I have observed this board doing. We don't have to choose between social responsibility and academic excellence. We can have both. We must have both. Thank you. Okay, you guys. At least we're doing like little little spurts of clapping. So thank you. All right. So Amber is on deck. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Will you sign up in the back real fast? Yes. And then absolutely you can. Go ahead. Good evening, my name is Amanda McDermott. I've been a teacher for 13 years and the past two have been in Ben Lapine. I'm also a parent. My boys will be entering second grade and kindergarten this fall. I'm very grateful to be part of the Ben Lapine School District and community. The main message I wanna to express tonight is the importance of navigating this school year with grace and compassion. So let me start by saying thank you for hosting this listening session. We're all aware of the division the past year and a half has wrought in our community. Really listening to one another, striving to actually understand one another, is the central path toward healing and greater unity. Today, you're hearing from individuals with very strong feelings that are generally polarized. I want to share that there is also a large group of us who are torn and tired. As a teacher, I know that masks and distancing restrictions also restrict the quality of the school experience. I want my son who is starting kindergarten to be seen and to be able to see his teacher and classmates without a mask. I want my son who is entering second grade to be heard for he is soft spoken and grew tired of having to repeat himself through the mask this past spring. At the same time, I don't want to see more people suffer from serious illness or elect to keep their children in CDL out of fear. And many of our students are coming to school from households where parents have elected not to be vaccinated. I stand by my friends, my family, and neighbors who exercise that right, but I'm torn about what that means for our classrooms. How do we balance personal liberty with community health? When the school district has the option again to make its own choices, which experts and studies will guide you? So my request is simple. Lead with humbleness, wisdom, and open communication in two ways. Number one, we need more listening sessions, perhaps facilitated with creativity in which community members are speaking to one another and not just at you. Ten. Help us wrestle with these questions in ways that foster understanding, compassion, and unity. And number two, in communications where decisions are shared with the community, please cite the sources that guided those decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, Amanda, can I have that? Okay, where's Amber? All right, on deck, Louise Harris. Oh, Louise, you're on deck. You're not, one more. Amanda's coming in front of you. Are you not a baseball girl? Maybe I should say, you're next, sorry. Hi, Amber. Hi, my name is Amber Hosick. I'm an EMS consultant and I get the privilege of working with the top ER physicians in the United States. Um, first, I would like to say thank you to our board members. Um, you ran, unlike other previous board members, not knowing that we were gonna be in a pandemic, you ran knowing that we were gonna be in a pandemic and you were overwhelmingly elected, so please trust your decisions. Second, um, the same ER docs that I work with work in other states, states that have had lax uh, rules. And those same ER physicians have children who are intubated currently in their hospital facilities. I came up here to say, before Kate Brown said masks are mandatory, uh, I came up here to say, please make sure that they stay in our school, K through 12. The same parents who are rallying against the medical professionals, our ER doctors and our local pediatricians wrote a letter to you guys 
stating the importance of mask wearing. The same parents rallying against this would not hesitate to take those physicians' advice. If their daughter was bleeding out, they wouldn't question the pharmaceutical given. If their daughter was having a diabetic emergency, they wouldn't question being given insulin. Asthmatic, <laughs> allergic reactions, epinephrine wouldn't be questioned. Those doctors' decisions would not be questioned in an emergency, and we are in an emergency. The Spanish flu, 30. 1918 to 1919, Guys. it lasted until 1922. We are in a society that works and lives closer together. To expect the pandemic to be over in a year, two years, is ridiculous, quite frankly, and I appreciate you guys, and I just want to voice that. Thank you, Amber. You guys. <laughs> okay, my apologies. Thank you for coming up to the mic, Louise. And our next speaker is going to be Diane Darling. Go ahead. There are three spirits that we all hear from. No matter how good of a person we think we are, it's a human spirit, hellish spirit, and Holy Spirit. And what we have to figure out is what spirit is guiding our children. Stop promoting CRT. It is a diabolical spirit birthed in the mind and heart of Lucifer to divide races and innocent young children. Stop teaching white children they are inferior race because they are the aggressor and white. Stop teaching non-white children they are victims of the white children because they are non-white. Is anybody confused? Yes. That's the whole point here. Confuse young innocent children. Stop indoctrinating children into Marxism. Marxism was birthed in the soul of Lucifer and carried out on this earth to the tune of hundreds of millions of people massacred. I've lived under socialism. I know something about it. It's not a good place. Stop sexualizing children as young as three years old. Oh my guys. gosh, you guys. You guys. Have mercy. Have mercy. That is the parents' role to do so, not the school boards and teachers. It would be better for a millstone to be hung around our necks, and I include my neck in that also, and thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Luke 17, 2. Repent. Five and turn from your wicked ways before the Lord requires your soul of you and you could spend eternity in hell. No, no, take no. this seriously. Ma no, I am taking it seriously. What? I just wanted to get that from you so we can give it to Laura. You don't want her to have it? Okay. You guys. Thank you. All right, you guys, we need to be equally, if we're gonna clap, let's make sure it's not equal. No, but, and also I just, <laughs> listen, you guys, if we're gonna if we're gonna be disrespectful to anyone, including me, I know, and she knows, she got a she got a visual. We're gonna we are going to continue to do our best to make sure that everyone is heard. And Louise had people making comments. I know some were in support and some weren't, but we want to hear from her. So let's make sure we offer the same support or silence for everyone. Thank you for being on deck. This is Diane Darling. Beth Hoover, you're up next. First of all, to the board, thank you very much for providing this opportunity to hear your community. My question is, are there structures in place to ensure that teachers are, rece are receiving continuous and meaningful professional development around anti-racist practices throughout the school year so that they can better equip our children? I ask this because if you look around the room, there's not only white people. I'm white. There's not only white people here. And I don't think it serves our children well to prepare them only to accept, work with, enjoy, value, like people. I think it serves them to be able to embrace everybody in the world because America is more than just white. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wanna, thanks. Oh yeah, you got it. Okay, Lorelei and then Jan Cox. Hi, Lorelai. 
No, I'm Beth. Hoover. Oh, Beth. Yeah. I'm skipping people. Beth, yeah. then Lorelei, then Jan. Okay. Um, it's not just important. It's essential to teach students about race and racism. If a subject becomes taboo to talk about, it becomes powerful and looms in our mind. We often draw erroneous conclusions, and then we later need to correct them. If we do this to our students here in Bend, we're doing a huge disservice in terms of preparing them to live and work and thrive in a diverse world. If even a silent message is given to teachers that they shouldn't teach or talk about race and racism, the job of teaching becomes incredibly difficult. I taught English at Lapine High School for 16 years. If that taboo had been in place when I was teaching, here are just some of the books that I taught that I would not be able to talk to kids about. Farewell to Manzanar. It's about the Japanese internment camps during World War II. To Kill a Mockingbird. Huckleberry Finn. The narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. The Crucible. Scarlet Letter. When the Legends Die. The interesting narrative of the life of Aludo Equiano. Letter from the Birmingham City Jail. And I also wouldn't be teaching authors like William Faulkner, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, John Steinbeck, and Maya Angelou, just to name a few. I can imagine being a history teacher under that stricture. I'd have to leave out great swaths of American history, including the founding of our country, the Civil War, and the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. Our students are smart. They can be taught the truth and given the tools to use critical thinking. There's no shutting the door on discussion of race and reconciliation. We would fail students miserably where we tried to try to do so, and Bend is not an enclave where the world ends at our city boundaries. Teaching students about race and racism is vitally important, and it's important for students to see themselves in the curriculum they're being taught. Thank you. Thank you. Beth? Beth? Nope. Okay, Lorelei, and then Jan. Beth, would you like me to give that to Dr. Nordquist? No. Okay. All right. You're up. Hi. I'm a little tall, so I'm just going to lean down. Okay. My name's Lorelei. I'm from Tennessee. I'm not from around here. <laughs> so y'all know more about Central Oregon than I do. Um, I just want to thank y'all for putting on this listening session. Seems like we really need it. Um, and I also want to thank Silver Rail for having us here today. Um, I wrote what I wanted to say tonight, and uh, I actually don't think I'm going to say any of that because I feel like I need to say something else. Sounds to me, listening to everybody here tonight, because I've been listening, seems to me like people are saying a lot of the same things. There's a lot of anger, a lot of distrust, a lot of confusion. None of us seem to know what's going on. And we seem to just be pointing in different directions at the problem. And you know what? That's what white supremacy does. Guys. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. I know. Y'all hear these words. We hear them all and all over and over again, even though none of us really know what it means. Part of the problem is that we're not educated on these topics. And so if we know more, we can better resolve conflict. Seems like there's a lot of conflict here tonight. So I hope that you continue to listen to our children and what they say that they need. And I hope that you lead boldly 25. in terms of pursuing equity in our district. Thank you. Thank you, Lorelei. <laughs> All right. So. We have on deck Jan. What number? We are on 19, you guys, and we have over 50. Whoa. Yep, it's awesome. I'm sorry, I need to say something else. You're up. Oh, you're not on deck, you're up. And Laura Daniels is next. Good evening, my name is Jan Cox. I've been in healthcare my entire life. I was recruited by Providence Health System to develop their hospitalist program in Portland, Oregon and managed and worked in a think tank shared office with infectious disease docs for 12 years. I also managed pediatric surgery, pediatric neurology, genetics, and a travel clinic. 
I had a Supreme Court appointment for four years to a citizen review board to review children's records who were removed from homes due to abuse or their own volition. I'm sharing this only because past board meeting parents have been told that we are spreading, frankly, misinformation, that parents are promoting mistruths. I'm insulted by that. And I join many parents who have made a point to become informed and educated. I've done research. I've spoken to several infectious disease docs frequently and followed this pandemic intensively. COVID-19 will mostly be with us for years to come. I was offering a solution um, that will appeal to both sides on several hot topics. Allow parents to make whichever decision is best for their own children. <sighs> Sorry. Um, parents know unique factors. They know health history, living conditions, their own tolerance of masks or vaccines. We can respect each other's rights by making individual family choices, not a forced mandate for all, like masks or no masks, vaccination or no vaccine. It's a personal, private choice. Please follow other bordering districts on optional masks and vaccines. I did read Governor Brown's 20. announcement today, and I just hope that the board and Dr. Cook will support a peaceful non-compliance. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Jan, do you want to want me to give that to Laura? You got it? You can deliver if you want. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jan. Laura. Laura Daniels. Leslie Barber is next after Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Thanks for being here. Hi, I'm Laura Daniels. Our American Republic is built on a foundation of God-given freedom. The founding principles of our Constitution are liberty, inalienable rights, and individual responsibility, not government overwatch of our health and safety. This virus has a 99.99% .99 survival rate. Children are less susceptible to COVID, and viruses become weaker as they mutate. The FDA must test various designs and materials before approving a medical device for disease mitigation. The small study in India failed peer review. FDA testing and standardization of cloth masks have never been done. The mask mandate is unconstitutional and unenforceable. There are multiple peer-reviewed studies proving the lack of effectiveness of cloth masks. The tests resulted in reduced oxygen saturation levels and carbon dioxide toxicity. High oxygen saturation levels correlate to mental acuity, focus, and comprehension. Thus, wearing a mask is in complete opposition to a quality learning environment. Ostracizing a group of people based on their personal medical choices is intolerable. Requiring masks only for unvaccinated students is in direct violation of the school's discrimination, harassment, and bullying policies. Furthermore, what we've done with our body is our personal information and is none of your business. <clears throat> we are protected on this account by the 14th Amendment. The CDC withdrew their request for emergency use authorization of the PCR test because it cannot adequately detect and differentiate between SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. Choosing not to inject our children with an experimental non-FDA approved substance, which by definition last summer is not a vaccine, exercises our constitutionally guaranteed rights and will not be met with discrimination or shame. Freedom is not given by the government and guidelines are Bye. not laws. Both the mask and vaccine guidelines break the 10 points of the Nuremberg Code. We, you can finish your sentence. One sentence. You guys, one, she one wants sentence. to finish her sentence, thank you. We the people are in control and I encourage everyone to stand up and reclaim their freedom. Thank you. If we do that one more time, we will wrap up, okay? Yes. So thank you for being respectful to everyone who's here to speak. Hi, my name is Leslie Barber, new topic. I am a board member of the Heart of Oregon Corps. Hawk is a partner with youth with the Ben Pine School District. A contract was signed between us and the school district for the years 2021 through 2023. This coincides with a recently announced $1.5 million three-year U.S. Department of Labor grant for the Heart of Oregon Corps to run the Youth Build program 
covering three counties in Central Oregon. Youth Build and AmeriCorps are two programs managed by the Heart of Oregon Corps to help youth ages 16 to 24 succeed in life. Hawk is also has summer programs and a co-op program with Jefferson County for special needs students. I would like the board to endorse experiential learning, providing youth with employment with local companies and learning a trade craft. Two, encourage the Ben Lapine School District to offer more opportunities for students, parents, teachers, career counselors, and administrators to learn about the Heart of Oregon's Core 6 programs on websites, in class, and in career learning settings. And three, attend the Youth Achievement Celebration on Thursday, August 19th at the Inn of the Seventh Mountain from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to hand that up here? Thank you. All right. Uh, Brandon, did you make it, Merritt? Because we've got a we got a backup for you. We have a backup for him. Oh yes, you can go. Okay, so we made a deal before that if the Merritts didn't make it, we would let someone slide in. What's your name? Uh, Jackie. So, Alandra, can you capture that Jackie is now number twenty-two? Thank you, Jackie. You have two minutes. Okay, my name is Jackie Hafner, and I attend uh, Pacific Crest Middle School. I'm going into seventh grade, and I'm 13. And I just have to say that as long as I've been in middle school, I've never witnessed any sexism, sexism or racism. And I'm, I think it should be educated, both of them, but I don't think it should be our top priority because I have friends that are black and Latino and you know, I have friends that are part of LGBTQ, and they are treated like every other kid in my school. And with masks, it's, I'm so sick of them, but it's like, I do sports. I do volleyball, track, cross country, I ski, and it's really hard. <laughs> and when you're outside running around and social distancing, I, it's not necessary, I don't think. And honestly, with adults, if they want to do masks and they can get vaccinated, I don't care. But it's like pushing it on young kids my age, to it's just wrong to me. It's not necessary for kids my age. I mean, because even if we did get COVID, half the time you don't even know you have it. And it's not like I'm going to die. I'll be okay. I'm done. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna break the rule. I would love to give her a round of applause because it's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. How old are you? 13, you guys. That's awesome that you can get up and speak in front of a crowd. So thank you for that. All right. Then we're on to Michael Funky. And I think I pronounced your last name wrong, Michael. I don't see him. Okay, Rebecca Easton and then Janet Whitney. And thank you guys for trying to settle down. I know it's going to be a long night of lots of good content, so it's worth staying. Can I lower this a little bit? I'm a little short. It's okay, go hard for it. For me. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Rebecca Easton, and you were all in my school. I teach here at Silver Rail. I love it. <laughs> I love my job. I love the district. And you know what? I've been with the district about 15 years, and last year was the hardest year ever. It was really, really difficult. I'm not going to lie about that. It was, there were days I didn't want to come to work. Like, it's like, I can't do this anymore. But you know what? My students came and I came and we came. We can do this. And things are hard. And my colleague across the hall from me has a sign that says, we can do hard things. We can do hard things. This mask has nothing to do with what I share with my students. It's my relationship with them. It's the relationship I have with families, with my colleagues, and with my administration. It's the relationships we have with each other in community. This mask is just a piece of cloth, keeping us all safe. So within that space of trust and care, that is where true learning and true academic rigor takes place. Mask or no mask, that has nothing to do with it. We're all being safe, and my students and I, we rose to the occasion, and we can do this. We can also do other hard things, like talk about racism, talk about homophobia, talk about white supremacy. We can do those hard things. 
Because if we don't, we are lost. We have to be able to do these hard things and we have to believe in our students and believe in ourselves, we can do this. And it is a disservice if we let our students down and don't engage in these really important discussions with them. Even very young students, of course, with age appropriate, thoughtful, well-planned discussions okay. and lessons. Even young students, we can do this. We have to, we have to let, um, be brave and engage in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Janet, and then John, number 26. You guys, I think we're about halfway there. So thank you for being here, it's awesome. Hi, I'm Janet Whitney, community member. Restorative justice equity is a group that w worked in partnership with Ben Lapine Schools for three years to put on three town hall symposiums for over 200 students of color in Ben Lapine High Schools. These kids came together to tell their stories and to open their hearts about what it's like to be a student of color in Ben Lapine Schools. Out of this came some good suggestions. Two were that we need to have a more racially an ethnically inclusive curriculum. And the second one, we need to have more teachers and leaders of color as role models. And I saw that the school administrators, the teachers, and the Lapine School, Bo uh, school Board listened to these comments and to these feelings. And I wanna thank you for following through and for working to make us a more culturally sensitive community and country representative of all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca, would you like me to take your script, Rebecca? Oh, well, they're lovely. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, I'm sure Laura would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, John Davidson and then Anna Field. Hey, John. Oh, we're getting that, we're not being consistent on the height. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> My name is John Davidson. Um, I would like to start today by acknowledging your contribution to the community. Perhaps because each of you has kids in the school system, you came to has, have a vision of a positive direction for our schools. As this vision became clear, you took the giant leap and decided to run. You then stood before the community and articulated your vision. You met with various groups and sat for interviews. The community saw and chose each of you in convincing fashion. Now that you're here, you see the community has more to say that can be addressed at your regular meetings, so you set up additional sessions to hear us. And you do this as volunteers. So I want to recognize your extraordinary de dedication to our community and applaud you for it. Thank you for your service. We are all in your debt. When it comes to potential mask policy, I think the recent stances of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC speak loudly. Both of these organizations have said that all children over age two should wear masks in school. Although a mask mandate curtails personal freedom this is not a constitutional issue. It's a public safety issue. We have many restrictions on personal freedoms because they are superseded by the interest in public safety. We have speed limits, room capacities, and burning restrictions. It is illegal to shoot a gun inside the city limits of Bend. This is not a Second Amendment issue. It's a public safety issue. No one is happy about wearing masks. No one is happy that COVID has become a central part of our existence but it has. Failing to deal with it or pretending that it's not as severe as it is, is to abdicate public trust. Obviously, the board is confronted with a difficult decision here. I have full confidence that you won't shrink from the task. Once again, I want to say thank you for your dedication. John, you want me to grab that? Thank you. Okay, Anna and then Bill. Thanks. So we are, um, Anna's number 27. You guys are keeping track. Hello, my name is Anna Field. I'm a parent of two children here. First, I want to say that 
It sickens me that members of the board have had their families attacked. Um, I'm so sorry that that has happened. And I just pray that our community will find a way moving forward so that everyone feels safe. And I will say that when we talk about not needing CRT, it's interesting to look at what the patterns are of who's being attacked and also how people are being spoken to at board meetings. I moved here from the South and in the South, when a white man says to a person of color, don't you roll your eyes at me, there is a word that follows that sentence and it is hateful. And there are acts that have been condoned in the South that I know we all find abhorrent. So I hope that we can just all consider the tone and we can make sure that everyone feels safe here. I want to be able to send my kids back to school in person and I have parents with health conditions and a child with a heart defect. Luckily, it's been benign up to this point, but I don't know what a bad case of COVID would do to her. I want your kids to not have to wear masks if they don't want to, but how does that work? Because really, 20. we are wearing masks for others. Your mask protects me way more than it protects you. That's how transmission works. So again, thank you for your service and I hope everyone stays safe. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, thanks Bill. Justin Richards, number 29, you are next up. Have at it, Bill. Hi, thank you. Um, it might be a little scattered. I have tons of notes. I didn't want to repeat a bunch of stuff everybody said, so. Okay, we'll give you five more seconds then. Um, <laughs> Um, I think, I, you know, I hear that everybody's trying to do the best they can to understand how to prevent things. Um, my big question, and I haven't heard a lot of it discussed tonight, is what's the science behind masks? I mean, I've heard uh, recommendations. I know Governor Brown has said we need to do this. I know Dr. Fauci and the CDC has said to do this. But what I haven't seen is the actual science and the studies behind what masks do. And so I, I looked into some of that myself and I found probably a 2008, a 2010, 2015 uh, metadata studies. And these are from reputable places like the New England Journal of Medicine that um, conclude that there's no real statistical benefit in transmitting a virus um, to other people or to yourself from wearing a mask. And so I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe Dr. Fauci, I mean, he even said in February of 2020 that masks are only effective for droplets, which would seem consistent with the studies that I've seen that in a surgical setting, a droplet going into a person, that's, that seems pretty reasonable to me. But as far as transmitting a virus, um, I haven't seen the studies and I know he changed his position on that, but again, I, I, I don't have the study for that. And so if, you know, you guys are doctors, if you have actual studies, I even heard the uh, head of uh, St. Charles say, you know, these are recommendations, so I'd appreciate the studies. Um, in addition, OSHA experts who are court approved subject matter experts um, totally deny that masks would work. In fact, um, in military applications, they said masks can actually spread more virus because you touch yourself. And so I wonder with young children, what's the benefit to young children wearing masks? We certainly know they're gonna be touching themselves and will that really stop the transmission? So anyway, Here's your five. Um, it, w the only thing I wanted to ask is I, I'm happy to submit these studies and, sure. and then get studies. Um, is there an email or something? You can like send it to list, uh, school hyphen board at bend.k12.or.us. Okay, I, okay. I might follow up with yeah. somebody. Or else. you can ask for a shorter one. We'll get you a shorter one. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Was that, that was Bill or Justin? Bill. Bill. All right then, Justin. Hey, and then Sharla Hansen is next. Hi, I'm Justin Richards. I have an eight-year-old son who goes to Pine Ridge. Thank you so much for spending some time and letting us come out here and voice our opinions. 
and dealing with the diverse number of opinions that we have. And I wanted to say to you specifically, I'm so sorry to hear about your daughter and your family. Um, I hope that doesn't happen ever again. Um, I think that it's incredibly important that we teach our children anti-racism and anti-racism is not anti-white. It doesn't put anyone down, it puts us together. So anyone trying to say differently is wrong. If anyone thinks that there isn't racism nearby or in this town, I'd like to tell you a story about my wife, who is a brown woman, going to Walmart in this very town and being told that she needed to go back to where she came from and that it was her fault that someone had to wear a mask even though she was born here in the United States is a and is a full-fledged American. If we're debating about telling the truth to our kids, then we're not, if we teach, if we don't teach truth, we're teaching lies. And that's not okay. I'm not okay with lying to my son. And as far as the masks go, anyone who wants to say that it's a, a personal choice, your personal choice affects my health and my son's health. If you can get, if he can get sick from you not wearing a mask or your child not wearing a mask because you don't care, then it's affecting somebody else and therefore it's not a personal choice. It's a public decision. 15. You can look at me when you say that. <laughs> no, it's, it's not you that I think needs to hear it the most. That's really all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Justin. Sharla. Sharla, I didn't see a lot of movement when I asked for Sharla. Okay, so we are going to go to 31, and then I wanna do like a 30 second grab water if you guys need water, and then we'll sit back down. Okay, so Scott, Sharla, and then Scott, but before Scott, wait a minute, Sharla's not here, Scott, and then we'll take 30 quick seconds to get a drink, and then come sit down and we'll go to Carrie, so that Carrie is number 32. How are ya? All right, you? You took you? like the outside lane. Yeah. Good evening, my name's Scott Freshwaters. I'm a 1973 grad of Bend High. And I'd like to read this uh, excerpt from this article. It comes out of the Epic Times, June 30th, by Joshua Charles. And this is about an incident that took place in Charleston, South Carolina, in April 16, 1865, right after Confederate General Robert E. Lee had just surrendered. The racetrack was called the Washington Race Course and Jockey Club. During the war, the Confederacy had used it to imprison Union captives. Nearly 300 of them died of diseases and exposure in the open air prison. None of them received a proper burial. Instead, their bodies were thrown in a nearby mass grave. Once the war had ended, however, some people, former slaves, found this to be totally unacceptable. Many of them went to the rat racetrack, exhumed the bodies, and gave them a proper burial in a new cemetery at the same site. They put a whitewashed fence around the cemetery and inscribed the words, Martyrs of the Race Course, on it. These former slaves knew that these men had died for their liberation, and they honored their sacrifices just miles away from the very spot where the Civil War had begun. As reported in the New York Tribune and the Charleston Courier just a week later on May 1st, 1865, more people came, about 10,000 of them. Almost all of them were African Americans, mostly freed slaves, while some were white missionaries. 3,000 black children bought, brought bouquets of flowers to honor those who had died singing John Brown's Body, a popular Union War song about the famous abolitionist John Brown, who by the way was white while doing so. Black ministers were present and recited portions of scripture. Veterans of various black regiments that served during the war were also present and performed double time marches in honor of their fallen comrades. Stories like this have to be told that teach gratefulness, thankfulness, honor, and respect. Thank you. Thank you. You wanna share that? Um, I'll photocopy it. Okay, that's awesome, thank I'll you. Okay, we're gonna do one two minute timer actually. So run, quick, stretch. Um, also, we should applaud this. Oh, there's two young people that are sitting still this whole time. Way to go. All right. How are you, do you need water?
All right, that was the two minute for all of us. So if you wanna start making your way back to your seats, Carrie, if you wanna start heading up, as soon as everybody's sitting, we will get back at it. Do you guys mind trying to see if you can get that door open to get a little bit of air in here? Thanks. It's hot, right? It's not just me. I'm like, if I just stand really still, it's not helping, no. All right, um, everybody, two second warning. We'd like to make sure we can hear what Carrie has to say at the microphone, so thank you. Ladies at the door, thank you for taking a seat. All right, it's all yours, Carrie. Okay, um, I read the CDC science brief on the transmission of COVID in K through 12 schools. Carrie, and can you step a little closer? Apologies for interrupting. Okay. Thank you. And I thank you for your continued commitment to science and the guidance of the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm a retired nurse with over 30 years of experience in the field. I also have a degree in psychology. I have broad experience in medical units, including infectious patients, as well as chemical dependency and psych. My last position, I was a hospice nurse, case manager, working with patients and families at end of life. Prior to my career in nursing, I worked with adults and children with mild to severe mental health conditions. One thing I feel that needs to be made very clear is that COVID is a medical public health issue. My mother talked about growing up under the shadow of polio. She also described her family's quarantine when she became ill with scarlet fever, complete with a public health notice attached to the front door of her home. They burned sheets and clothes to prevent transmission of, transmission of this infection to others. Stopping the transmission of disease was the number one public health policy. It was a stressful time, but communities pulled together and they survived. Children survived and grew into stable, functioning adults. The current COVID threat requires public health protocols. The current CDC and AAP rec recommendations which includes children wearing masks in school are based in fact and research and are intended to protect not just children, but communities as a whole. I've worked with patients with post polio syndrome whose post condition is far worse than their original infection. 15. We know COVID can, can uh, result in death, but we have no idea what post COVID will look like 10, 20 or more years from now. Children are resilient. They need to know they are safe that adults are in control. They will survive with their mental health intact if adults guide them calmly, responsibly, create, <laughs> creatively, and thoughtfully through this public health crisis. Thank you again for your efforts Thank and you, your Carrie. continued commitment. To the Do you want me to take that? Uh, sure. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. I'm gonna sneak up on everybody when they get, get toward the end there. Okay, uh, number 33, Merritt Judith, not here. We're good. Everybody good? Okay. Anyone anyway, over here? Okay. Uh, Tim Lynch. Tim from the back. Is there a breeze back there at all, Tim? Yeah. Uh, thank you, school board, for uh, volunteering for your positions and for allowing this session today. Uh, my name's Tim Lynch, and I'm a parent of both a middle school and high school student in Ben Lapine School System. I came here today to express my view that the district keep children in school um, both full-time and for extracurricular activities uh, this year, despite what may come in terms of increasing COVID cases. I feel strongly about this for a number of reasons. First, COVID is likely to be present in our community for years, and we'll need to manage how to live with it. We have to consider that the next few years may not be much better than where we are right now. Second, those of high school age and most of those of middle school age have now had the opportunity to be vaccinated, offering substantial protection from serious illness. Third, it's well documented that the mental, social, and educational costs of not consistently attending school over a period of years are significant and almost impossible to fully recover from. And lastly, these costs, costs hold true in particular for those students that may be socioeconomically disadvantaged, do not have the luxury of a non-working parent at home, 
and for those who may rely on the fabric of our public school system for their general support and well-being. Despite what the pandemic may bring this year, the cost-benefit analysis should land squarely on keeping our kids in school, especially high school and middle school kids, as I said, the vast majority of whom have been eligible to be vaccinated. Unlike last year, we now have better knowledge and tools to deal with the pandemic. 20. Hence, I urge the school district to resist using blunt force measures such as school closures or widespread quarantines as a result of contact tracing for children who may be in the same room with someone who did have COVID. Um, instead, let's prioritize the long-term well-being of our kids over managing infection rates at all costs. Our families want our kids in school. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, you want me to grab that? I'm just gonna, I like creepily go after everyone for their paper. Okay, Callista, and then Eric, 35 and then 36. Uh, and I'm Julianne Retman, by the way. I don't, somebody asked me who I was. Um, not a board member, staff, I work for you guys, I work with the board, and um, I'm a director of communication, safety, and then also support our return to school efforts. So thank, thank you. you for everyone. Thank you. No clapping. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Callista Songstead. I am the mother of four sons who were in the Ben Lapine School District from 2012 to 2020 at High Lakes, Cascade, and Pacific Crest Middle Schools, Summit, and Skyline High Schools. For a little background, along the way, I've helped with Walk to Read, tutored our fourth and fifth graders in math, helped run the Scholastic Book Fair, participated in the PTO, PTA, and was on the site council at High Lakes for two years. Five and a half years ago, my second born son received a flu shot that caused him to develop grand mal seizures, the first of which occurred right at High Lakes Elementary. His classmates and teachers were traumatized but looked after him until I could arrive. And after being diagnosed with vaccine-induced epilepsy, kept a very close eye on him and offered him academic and emotional support. The next fall, he attended Pacific Crest Middle School and during the opening assembly in the beautiful new gym, the sound and light triggered a chain of grand mal seizures. I had just left the school minutes before having signed a 504 plan for him with the school nurse. We adjusted his schedule to eliminate the gym from his schedule by making him the office aide that period close to admin and the nurse. The teachers were all asked to check in with me once a week to be sure he could keep up with his classes, to make eye contact, to check in with him throughout the class, and to send someone to check on him if he ever asked to take a break and didn't come back for more than 15 minutes. Only one teacher honored this request in the year and a half that he was there, no matter how many times I phoned or emailed. When the school decided that student office aides weren't allowed anymore, we gave him an extra art class. And then it was decided that that was against the rules too. And for whatever period of the day he missed, I would have to drive to the school and pick him up because he wouldn't be allowed to be on school grounds. So a year and a half later, I just pulled him out of school to be with me for the remainder of middle school. As a freshman, he wanted to try to go back and be with his friends, so we gave Skyline a chance, knowing it was a smaller, quieter venue with small class sizes. And I wish I could say that's where the success story started, but again, the 504 was ignored. My emails went unanswered. Am I done? Yes, but I would like to invite you to catch up with Laura or myself afterwards so we could get your information so we can connect on this. I would like and to we would like to take in, that as and well. I would like to say goodbye to the school district. We are okay. gone forever. Okay, that's a sorry. Yeah. Thank you. We'd still, if you want to reach out, I would still like to talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Sorry, two minutes. You're great. Okay, Eric. Thanks, Eric. The Jody, you're up next. Oh, sorry, not. You can come together. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. You guys, maybe. Thanks, Jody. All right, Eric. Okay, this is intimidating being in front of so many constitutional scholars. Um, so I don't know if anyone saw, but today there was uh, news in the New York Times and Washington Post about the Delta variant that indicated that vaccinated adults could spread much more than previously understood. The science evolved and the guidance around vaccinations and masking will continue to evolve and change. And when that does happen, the school board should follow that too. For the gentleman looking for additional scientific articles, there's a recent study out of the MIT Particle Lab demonstrating that virus particles are not only contained in droplets, but they're also being aerosolized, which means that they are much easier to spread. And now we know that the pandemic is much more dangerous than we understood before that study was done. 
As mentioned by some people, freedom has some limitations. To use an analogy, you could put your family in the car, not wearing seatbelts, and drive through every single red light on the way home, but it would be irresponsible, dangerous, and stupid. The pandemic is more complicated, but it has killed over 300 children. That amounts to 0.01% of children diagnosed with COVID-19. That's one in 10,000. It's pretty good odds for Vegas, but not with children's lives. If there was a one in 10,000 chance, I would keep my kid home and inside wearing a mask, in a bubble, everything possible. So I would advise the school board to continue to follow the science as it evolves. Thank, Thank you. you. Jody. Thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Abby, you're up next. My name is Jody Percy. I'm a community member, and um, you can relax because I'm not going to be talking about COVID today, so Ooh. you're good. What I am going to talk about is anti-racism training because there's a lot of misinformation by parents, and I would really, really tell the parents to get educated about this. This is not what you think it is. Jody, okay? will you talk to yeah. me or them? Um, Thank you. Equity is actually not equality. Um, Equity is redistribution, okay? So what we want when we're raising our children as parents is we want strong children with thick skin who do not back down, who can handle life, who can handle life experiences in the workforce, in school, whatever. This training does the opposite, okay? Because what it does is it, it, apparent, it says that equity is something that we have to give you you're not going to have to work for it, okay? So you're raising children into adults who now are entitled, and they're entitled because they've been told that they've, they're victims, and they, they, they are entitled because they, they're, they're told that now it's their turn, they can have this. And so instead of saying, you know, any, any parent would say, I want you to go out, and I want you to work for it. I want you to go out onto the basketball court, onto you know, medical school, and you need to work, okay? Because you are going to be the one who benefits from that. Um, the last thing you wanna do is tell that child, we're gonna give you that degree because of equity. And, and some past problem that we had in the past. Now, as far as I know, Racism is taught in every school in the United States and has been for 50 years. There's no Five. problem with teaching racism, zero. So it's only the amount and the type and the quality of education that I'm talking about. Thank Not you. Not enough time. Do you want us Not to have time. that? Yeah. Okay. So this has some good information for the... Awesome. Thank you. Do you want to put your... Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. Abby? Jordan? Nope. Okay. Nicole Murphy? Thanks, Nicole. That extra. Thank you, everybody, for allowing us this chance to speak. My name is Nicole Murphy, and my husband and I have lived in Bend for 26 years. I have taught science in this school district for 20 years. My three children have all received their K through 12 education in Ben Lapine schools. My youngest son will be a senior this fall. My first point is that not enough time is being spent on course content. During online school last year, two of my son's teachers spent the entire first semester on anti-bias and anti-racist assignments. Although their curriculums are very different, both his English and psychology teachers gave similar assignments with hardly any curricular content. We encouraged our son to do these assignments until we realized that our son was actually being targeted as a racist by his teachers. We immediately removed him from these two classes. The writing prompt given to our son by one of his teachers was about a study that was done where kids that live rurally, like my son, learn to be racist from their parents. After reading through the prompt, my husband and I realized that not only was our son being discriminated against, but so was our rural lifestyle. We are a Christian family and have taught all three of our children to never judge others, especially on the color of their skin. As a teacher, I have seen the division among my students that the teaching of critical race theory is causing. This is not the way to bring our kids together. 
My second point is that politics is being disguised as social justice in the classroom. The line has been blurred between social justice and politics in the classroom. According to my own children and also from what I observed, some teachers are pushing their politics on our kids. The sign of a good teacher is when kids do not know that teacher's political affiliation. Teachers can be fired for this. 20. And all of, my, all of our children need to feel safe and welcome in our schools. And unfortunately, my son no longer does. Teachers need to stop pushing their per personal political views and devices, divisive theories on our kids. Contrary to what people here are saying, I talk with my students frequently about racism if it comes up. I'm hearing people call that parents against critical race theory are white supremacists, and this is simply not true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Would you like us to hold on to that? Do you want that in the record? Okay, uh, just a reminder that we're trying to record, I, and I think we're doing it well, hopefully. And it's um, tied into all the microphones, so anybody who's speaking, you're gonna be able to pick it up. So just a reminder of that. And I think John is recording. Yeah? You gonna tell us where that's gonna be? Well, they might wanna know. No? Are you gonna put it out live for them? John! Jeez, I thought maybe that was your hookup. Um, okay, so we are on, are we on number 39? 40. 40. 40. Monica, and then Michelle. My name is Monica Dennis. I am here tonight to talk about curriculum concerns. First, I am requesting transparency from the district. And second, the reduction of the level of dominance of one idea as they both relate to curriculum content. To illustrate, when our student forecasted for the junior level lit and comp class, it was expected the course would follow the description in the published curriculum guide. It did not. It was shockingly different. The new curriculum material focused solely on anti-bias, anti-racist units at the expense of literature genres and growing students' composition skills. The material assigned was more in line with a sociology course and should have been taught as such rather than the lit and comp course it was used in and pushed upon the unwitting students. In addition, the level of dominance of one-sided views some may refer to this as hegemony, which inhibits the providing material of alternative ideas, was exceptionally high. Only material that supported the specific narrative of racism and white privilege was provided to the students. It wasn't until we inquired did we discover that the district was engaged in the ideologically driven pilot program to achieve the district's equity goals. Let me be clear. Our students, the very students that we as parents entrust to the Ben Lapine School District to be exceptionally educated by you, are not test subjects. We as parents should never have been blindsided by the content of the ideolo ideologically driven pilot program. The district should have been transparent and upfront with their plans, including a description of the content material. In addition, the level of dominance of one idea, or hegemony, should have been eliminated and multiple resources presenting various opinions in order for students to develop key critical thinking skills should have been provided. In short, my question to the school board is, what will the school board and the district do to be transparent with parents regarding all curriculums and pilot programs the district is testing with our students? And second, how will the school board and district design curriculum to reduce the amount of one-sided views being presented in classes with an ideological agenda? Thank you for your Thank time. You. Good wrap up. <laughs> Did you get it all in there? Okay, Michelle, and then I think Danielle White did not make it. So Michelle, and then Mike Henderson. My name is Michelle McDevitt. I have three kids who have all been part of the Ben Lapine School District at one point or another over the last 11 years. Why are you masking our kids? If it's to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2, a simple web qu query may lead you to numerous studies showing that mask mandates have not been very effective in preventing the spread of SARS-CoV-2, because here we are. And most children do not get severely ill from SARS-CoV-2. The infection fatality rate is 0.05 in persons under the age of 70. Children fail to, fail to learn social cues and phonics from their muzzled peers and teachers. But what I really want to get across to you is what a web search may not tell you. The psychological impact of masks and shuttering schools has been devastating. Google can't show you the panic in a parent's eyes when their children, when their children pass out 
and nearly die from mask wearing, which has happened here in Central Oregon. A Google search can't show you a parent's heartbreak because their child was one of the 60 plus kids in Oregon who has committed suicide in the past 18 months. A web search also can't show you the daily tears in my third grader's eyes when forced to stay home, away from her teacher, her friends, and her just plain normalcy. A web search also can't show you my fifth grader's anger over abandoning a year-long project and panic when she was told she had to mask up, knowing with borderline asthma she wouldn't be able to breathe, or the sheer disruption of my kids' lives from being shuttered out of athletics and activities. You have a decision to make. We parents know you have been given guidelines which are not laws. Please listen to the hundreds of parents here tonight who have written, called, and asked you to do the right thing. Leave mandatory masks out of Ben Lapine schools this year and going forward. The harmful effects on forcing kids to wear masks and locking them out of schools far outweigh any feel-good factor from parading around with a piece of cotton over your face. The virtue signaling can stop now. We see beyond your charade. Our kids deserve to breathe free and have their lives back. Unmask our kids, open our schools, and return normalcy to their lives. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to, do you want me to slip that one up there? Thanks, thank you. Hey there. Is this, right. You don't look like a Danielle. Oh, Mike. Yeah, yeah good. That's who we want up. Okay. Yep. We're okay, just checking. All right, all right. All right. Yeah, so yeah, Mike Henderson is my name. Um, basically, regarding the masks, uh, essentially the question I believe we're trying to answer is, is there enough scientific information supporting the school being able to usurp the patient or the parent's usual medical decision-making authority whether or not they want to have their children wear masks? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, there are mechanistic studies showing that masks do contain droplets and aerosols, but there are no real-world studies showing the effect of masks in schools and the prevention from one child to the uh, uh, teachers or to the rest of the community. Uh, so that's essentially the main point I have here. Um, what we do, so the mechanistic studies, yeah, I'm just going to skip that part, uh, but um, so the, the mechanistic studies themselves are inadequate to justify or recommend uh, any policies regarding masking. Essentially, uh, what you need to know are what's the prevalence of the virus in the community, how large is the room, how many people are in there, how, many, how long are you in there, what's the ventilation like, and how long do masks last. Uh, actually, the, uh, the COVID researcher experts that I can find suggest that cloth masks that children use typically last maybe up to 90 minutes. They certainly don't last longer than four hours, and they certainly don't last a whole school day. Uh, the other main point I'll end with is uh, viruses, we, we do not stop them. Uh, this virus, it looks like it's here to stay. You can mask, you can do whatever you want. Eventually, de the Delta virus it has an uh, R-naught of about six, which is highly contagious. You're gonna get it one way or the other, unless you've been vaccinated. So those are the, my main points, thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, Virginia. Virginia, thank you for coming over there. And then next up is Aaron, and then Alandra or Janet. We're not that close, but we're within like five, ten people. Do we have some more names? Okay, cool. All right, go for it, Virginia. Thank you. Dear board members, you. my name is Ginny Sackett, and I'm a Bend resident. Thank you for this listening session. I would like to add my voice to the many families voicing their support for the equity work the school board has prioritized. I am a strong proponent of addressing systemic racism in the district. I support culturally competent curriculum, Black Lives Matter, and integrating extensive and accurate Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian history in the everyday part of our students' learning. We must be inclusive of all. As one who has a doctorate in educational leadership, I also support cultural competency training for our teachers. Furthermore, as a clinical therapist, I am delighted to hear about the restoration justice program being integrated in our school system. The pro program provides a new way forward for our kids involved in conflict. So school board members, please continue to confront systemic racism and oppression, both inside and outside the classroom. I value free choice, but I value community health more. 
I value the lives of even the most vulnerable members of our community. I value the history and perspective of those who have been marginalized in our community. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Aaron, how'd you know? Good. This is number 45, everyone. Yep. And then John, you're up number 46. Go ahead, Aaron. Thanks. <clears throat> so my name is Aaron Rook, and I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. I work in... So I'm also very soft-spoken. Uh, my name is Aaron Rook, and I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. I work in higher education and as a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. I've provided equity trainings to students and educators in K-12 and college contexts. As I sit and listen to folks' comments, I can't help but to reflect on how easy it can be to give in to fear. Fear of change, fear of the unknown, fear of pushback, fear of one another. But fear is antithetical to learning. For the sake of the students and educators we serve, I encourage you to remain steadfast in your values and to resist giving in to fear. In particular, I urge, you, I urge you to lead the district in being clear, courageous, and accountable, and advocating for LGBTQ plus students, their safety, and their success. Outspoken support is especially important now as lawmakers across the country seek to curtail the rights of LGBTQ students. And while these rights are well protected in the state of Oregon, our students and educators take in the national conversation and see it reflected locally in objections to comprehensive sex ed and LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. While I don't doubt that district leaders care about all of their students, a lack of physical, visible support can be deadly. We know that LGBTQ students are more likely to experience harassment, assault, and to attempt suicide, but also that affirming support can protect students from a host of negative outcomes. However, the historic reluctance of Boundless Pine schools to openly and consistently support LGBTQ students, families, and staff, unfortunately serves to reinforce a dangerous false narrative that LGBTQ people are sexual deviants who can't be trusted around children. This hateful stereotype is so pervasive that despite being an adult and an educator, I don't feel particularly safe in this space as an out LGBTQ person. Fortunately, there are more resources than ever to guide districts in supporting LGBTQ students and staff. But it will take courage and fortitude to show up for these students and employees in the face of the politicization of their identities and experiences. I look forward to the day when LGBTQ students and employees can live, work, and study openly without fearing for their safety or security. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, John. Thanks, John. And then Thomas, you're next. Is Thomas here? Okay. So it might be Jennifer after John. Thanks, John. Hey, how's it going? My name's John Halen. Uh, I didn't have time to write up something, so this is gonna kind of just kind of wing it. Um, I just want to say that my dad had polio. Um, it was weird growing up around a parent that had hard use of his legs, and because of it, it took his life early, like most polio victims. I also served in the Peace Corps in West Africa, where I got to live with polio victims, and I fundraised for people that, you know, could get wheelchairs for these people. And I think about the, the, the push for vaccination with polio and how we need to have something similar. So I have two kids in Ben Lapine, two daughters, and yes, they don't like wearing masks, but we understand it's necessary for the protection of the community, so we do it. I also hope that if it, the vaccine ever gets approved for children, that just like MMMR and polio, we mandate that kids have the vaccine to be at school. Now, for the next minute, I'm gonna talk about the fact that I think it's ridiculous that we have to talk about that it's okay to teach racism in school. Um, the Civil Rights Act was 1965. There are still people alive today that were throwing tomatoes at Ruby Bridges. I mean, this is not something that's gone away. This is something that's endemic to our society right now. It's built into our very law structure. And as someone who majored in history, it's really frustrating to hear people say that they don't want to learn about history because it makes them uncomfortable. The fact that I had to learn about the Tulsa massacre 30. on an HBO show is ridiculous. How ridiculous is that? The fact that we have to, you know, we say like, oh, Thomas Jefferson raped his slaves. Yes, that happened. We can't, we can't pave that over. And to ignore that is to ignore a whole century and century and century of trauma that other people have experienced and still experience to this day that's built into the very fabric of the society. And so I hope that we keep teaching the proper things to our kids. Thank you. Thank you, John. Also, way to wrap it up right there. Okay. Sorry, can I just oh, say one thing? Maybe two. Really wait, wait, no, we have to do it. Yeah. So my mom also we're gonna we're they gonna never keep working. Shut down schools during polio. Okay. Well, let's. All right. Thank you, though. Uh, you can tell me later. After.
We have more? Okay. Thomas was not here, I don't think. Okay. Jennifer Hamilton. How are you, Jennifer? Excellent. We're great. Thanks for being here. Right? That's good. And then Jim Murphy. Good evening. You want to step up close? Get real. There you go. Are we dating now? Yes, so, we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you and the mic. Yeah. Oh. That's Mike. Mike. Yeah. I thought I lost him. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, we already started your time. Go right ahead. That's all right. Um, what I'm doing is coming and asking for help. I've run into a roadblock. My grandson is going from seventh to eighth, and his skills are in math are minimal. How do I get a copy of the curriculum? You don't have textbooks. But if I could get what he was supposed to learn in seventh and what he's going to learn in eighth, hopefully, I can start getting him caught up and then prepared. And I've emailed the, oh, I'm so nervous. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've emailed the school he'll be starting at Pilot Butte, and I don't have an answer from there. I called the main office, and we referred to the state standards, which are good, but that's not a curriculum. I need, I need problems in a book, please. How do I do that? How about if? I have Scott get your contact information. Scott's right behind me. Okay. And we will have someone give you a call tomorrow to talk more. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Wait. Thank you. Is this Jim Murphy? It is. Well, hi, Jim Murphy. Well, hello. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I thought you had a duck well, shirt on, but it's an eagle. It's a bigger bird. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm a OSU beaver. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry for all the duck sorry. fans out there. All right. You have the floor. Thank you. Hi. My name is Jim Murphy. I'm a former high school biology teacher, both teaching uh, biology and human anatomy. And I would like to bring to the board and the community tonight uh, my concerns for the sex ed program in our schools. Let me start by asking you, the board members, all of you, please, uh, rhetorically, of course, uh, at what age did you teach your mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. the reproductive parts of the human body? Well, you know. Show them and explain to your child a penis, a vagina, breasts, nipples, testicles, scrotum, a uterus. Quite frankly, this old man, including a 26-year Navy veteran, is embarrassed to even ask that question. But we teach that to our five-year-old children. Yes, our kindergartners learn that in school, and I think this is totally wrong. Well. When did you teach your children the definition of sexual orientation? I hope it was by age eight, because then you would be in step with the state standards. Why would we want our children, your children, to be learning these at this age, or let alone the children that you are elected to protect and educate? If you have bothered to read the state standards on health education, and you can't see that as a steady indoctrination of children to go the way of what someone else thinks is best for them to learn, then I'm baffled. I know as a former teacher, I had a lot of latitude 20. and influence on what I taught my students. This subject, like many, is best left to parents and how they see fit to raise their children. Put sex ed back in just the high school arena and just the health information that is necessary, not the personal and moral teachings by strangers that is now taking place. Thanks, Jim. Thank Can I have that? Thanks. Okay, I'm going to do a, a time check. So we have now been together for two hours, which was the commitment here. Um, we have one more person on the original list, and we have a number of people who we probably have 35 minutes of additional folks. So I'm going to just make an executive decision here. This is huge that everyone is here, and I know you might be hungry, so grab something to eat, but I'm going to make an executive decision, Dr. Cook, that we're going to go for it for half an hour if people need to leave. Um, I need to honor you two and make sure you don't have a commitment at like six or what time would that be? Eight? 
Yeah, it's over, we're here. Okay, so thank you to everyone for sticking around, and if you need to leave, um, this is your chance to sneak out. Courtney Landis, though, is the last one who has signed up early. Everybody else signed up here, which we still want to honor. So Courtney, thank you for coming up. Hello, I'm Courtney Landis. Um, basically, most of what I was going to say has been said in one form or another. So I'd just like to say that um, Please don't mandate masks and vaccines for our children. And don't, if, our, if we choose not to vaccinate our child, please don't make them have to wear a mask. Looking different and being different is very difficult in middle school and high school. I have a high schooler and um, I just don't think that they should be discriminated against, made fun of, especially in this day of social media where everything that kids do is posted online and they are made fun of and when they're made fun of online, it is done in a way that you don't have to see what's being said. You don't have to see the effect that it's having on your children or the person that it's being said to. And so just to keep that in mind, to not have discrimination going on in our schools. Um, I also think that if our education system is in the 40s in the nation, we should be focusing on teaching them the basics, the reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, <laughs> science. I, I, I do think like there is a small portion of the critical race theory that's important, but that should not be our main discussion here. Our main discussion should be how do we educate our children more? How do we get our children in Oregon to be number one in the nation instead of in the 40s? That is just ridiculous. And then as far as online learning goes, um, doing everything on a computer sucks. Like I tried to help my kid with math last year. On a computer, it's ridiculous. Pen and paper needs to be brought back into the schools. They need to learn how to go to a library and look up a book. I know 15. this day and age is everything about digital and we do need to honor that, but we also need to go back to some pen and paper. And then as far as the digital thing, we should be spending more time teaching them social citizenship for the digital age, to be nice and kind. Thank you. So, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try to do a little deal with everybody. So if you signed up, but you feel like what you wanted to talk about was covered, um, maybe you could just do a real quick here, or you can pass, or you could say, I wanna be someone to speak at the next go round of this. So it's just an option. Okay, Elizabeth and then Kate Batterson. Oh, hi, you're right there. Hi. Yes. hi. I'm actually going to scrap what I was originally talking about because there's been a few issues that come up that I want to address. One, I've been called a white supremacist. Nobody knows my life prior to coming to Oregon. I grew up in Connecticut outside of Hartford in a suburb. I went to college in the middle of Boston at Leslie College for Women, experienced gays for the first time in my life. I taught, student taught in Josiah Elementary, Josiah Quincy Elementary in Boston, inner city, I was the minority. I had to be driven back and forth to my placement at that school because it was dangerous for me to take the tea. As an adult, I chose to run a migrant Head Start program here in Madras. I lived and died by protecting those kids who aren't citizens in this country and their parents to make sure that they were healthy and okay. I went back to the East Coast for a few years so my kids would know their parents. My two children were so far behind in school, it wasn't funny. My son had missed two years of mathematics. He'd missed the United States 100%. He was in fourth grade when we moved. He was so far behind, it took me three years of tutoring him to get him caught up to the curriculum on the East Coast. My daughter, I pulled out of school in sixth grade because the school was no longer offering gifted and talented programs. They put her in an eighth grade classroom with sixth grade, or she was sixth grade, they put her in eighth grade classrooms. She had five sets of stitches from being beat up, tripped, hit with balls in the head, just off of cameras. I homeschooled her through middle school. We moved back here again when she would have been in eighth grade. We tried to put her in school. 
You don't want to know what happened. The school district wanted her to walk to the high school for her geometry because they only offered pre-algebra. That's not okay. And I just want to say that masking and vaccines are personal choices, not something the schools need to be doing. Thank you. So Elizabeth. don't call me a white supremacist. At University of New Hampshire and Keene State College, I taught diversity. Thank and you. I won an award for pluralism and diversity from the University of New Hampshire. Thank you, Elizabeth. OK, Kate. Is Kate still here? Kate, do you want to address the board leadership? OK, Kate snuck out. Rob. Thanks, Rob. You stuck it out. Thanks, Rob. I need to raise this thing because that's not even right. Just this isn't your, fair. You could just use your baritone voice. This is not voice. fair, though. <laughs> it's about being fair. All right. Uh, my name is Rob Imhoff. I'm born and raised Oregonian, living in Central Oregon since 2005. I feel like I have a vested interest in our nation, state, county, city, and schools. I've coached basketball, football, baseball, and golf for over 20 years at all different levels through high school varsity, and most of my adult life has been involved in full-time and volunteer youth work. I've got three boys that are 12 to 25, and I've got two grandkids that are uh, six and eight. So I have a little bit at stake. I came to specifically address the mask requirement, but I'm going to address CRT initially, as well as any other racially focused study, which at its core divides each of us based on the racial composition of each and every one of us. To be an American is not inclusive or exclusive to any specific race. It's an idea which includes all races. It's a belief and system of ideas that millions of Americans of all colors have both fought and given the ultimate sacrifice to defend. To oversimplify people down to how we look flies in the face of the progress we've made as a people, as well as where we intend to go. To simplify any American through their race ultimately creates division. I have many brothers and sisters from about every race and color. To train our children to filter and define their worth through the lens and curriculum of CRT and social justice or any other prioritizing ethnic study is to minimize their actual value. We should be searching for the content of a person's character, not the color of their skin. Equality is not equity. Equal opportunity to succeed versus 30. redistributing livelihoods through taxing from those who earn to give to those who don't. This is called socialism. I can stand up and discuss with you about the efficacy of mass, and we would likely debate and disagree all night, because the truth is the science is not settled. What I think we can agree on is that masks, specifically when put on children, have many unintended negative consequences. Some, exa some examples being respiratory dysfunction, including secondary infection, Five. lack of peer-to-peer -peer interactions, diminished self-worth, and a stifling and elimination of most of their nonverbal communications, something as simple as a smile. I'll finish with this. Those who are willing to trade their liberty for security deserve neither. I promise to fight for your liberty and your freedom, and I'm asking that you do the same for my kids and my family here in Central Oregon. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy Knowles. Wendy Knowles, are you still here? Yes. Oh, hi, Wendy. Yes, Everyone hi. that's close, I'm like hey. looking way out there. Hi. I'm Wendy Knowles, and I just thought this letter pertained to this evening. It's from um, Dr. Sarah Johnson from Crook County and it was a tiny bit over sorry it was okay but that's really good it's um, yeah. dear valued parents Crook County School District was surprised to learn of Governor Kate Brown's mask mandate today for Oregon Public Schools after she announced in late June that all future decisions about COVID-19 protocols would be decided at the local level since the beginning of July our school district has served over 1,000 students in the largest summer school program in the region. Students have been in school without masks. Let me repeat that, without masks. And we've reported no, let me repeat that again, no outbreaks or spread of the virus. This is why I fully support the opportunity to make our own decisions based on what's happening with the virus at the local, wait, based on what's happening with the virus at the local level and develop COVID-19 safety plans with our incredible partners at the Crook County Health Department. My goal, hang on, I have to. 45, you're doing good. Okay. My goal is to allow staff and families to make their own health decisions about masks while also fully supporting anyone who wants to wear one for their own protection. 
We also offer two robust online programs, Crook County Online Option and Grizzly Mountain Home Link for families who have concerns about COVID-19. I'm determined to retain local control decision making that is in the best interest of our community and Crook County School District. Warm regards, Dr. Sarah E. Johnson. And oh, sorry. for me, I would like to get rid of the CRT and I would like to bring the Bible and Jesus back into our schools because you know what? When that disappeared, this all started to fall apart. So bring Jesus back. Thank you. And the Ten Commandments. Okay, Becky. Becky, are you here? Becky has black plasmin. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. Okay, a reminder while everyone's coming up here. We're trying to record this and we will get it out to you somehow. My name is Becky Plasman. I'm a professor at Central Oregon Community College where I have taught Ben Lapine School graduates for the last 26 years, as well as working with current high school students and teachers. I have also taught at both the elementary and high school levels. I would like to express my support for the current school board recently elected by the majority of Central Oregon voters. Specifically, I would like to, sorry, I would like to thank Marcus for all he has personally done for my students when they need help with housing, food, and other emergencies that interfere with their education. Uh, in the fall, Matt, if in the fall, masks are recommended for students and staff by the Oregon Health Authority, then the schools must follow and enforce that science-based advice, which is intended to keep our students safe, healthy, Becky, and me, in everybody. the classroom learning. Our schools should continue to provide a fact-based curriculum providing our students with a nuanced and robust view of the complex world we all live in. The injustices of our past and our present are appropriate and necessary parts of everyone's learning, both children and adults. Teachers and students must be allowed to examine the world unrestricted by people who would prefer 15. to pretend that difficult conversations about racial and social injustice do not belong in schools. In response to those emphasizing their constitutional liberties without their constitutional responsibilities, you look at five the, words the from the US Constitution, we the people in order to promote the general welfare. Thank you, Becky. Okay, Chris. Chris, What's the last name? Um, uh, you said you want to talk about everything. Is that you? Oh boy, oh boy. All right, you got two minutes, Chris. All right. Uh, so I didn't come uh, very prepared, but um, I'd just like to say I graduated high school in 2013, and a couple things that my high school failed to teach me was how to balance a checkbook, apply for a business loan, how to budget, how to work credit cards, and uh, how to start my own business. So do I think you guys are prepared to teach my child about race? I really don't think we're there yet. So I think, I think it's a good idea, but I think we're a little premature on that. I think right now that's being introduced because you guys are trying to appease a very radical left side. And I think we need to just kind of take into consideration that there's a lot of different educational standards that we haven't met yet. That's about it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, I think anytime Chris wants to talk about everything, you guys should let him. That was very succinct. Thank you. Okay, Greg, I had to put my reading glasses on for you, Greg. You have like architect printing. Yeah. yeah. No, that's not it. It looks no, like an architect no, or something. Yeah, I, I'm a former high school uh, teacher from Los Angeles who's part of the uh, chain migration up here as uh, grandparents working with uh, and helping support our daughter and our grandchildren. Uh, I thought when I 
was in high school that most kids around me were terribly bored and I felt very sorry for them because it was um, for me interesting. We were studying geometry and we were studying theorems and, and postulates, how to prove things. So we were had a different kind of education even back then, but geometry was probably the only course in which it wasn't a matter of indoctrination, it was just a matter of process. We knew that it was indoctrination and we weren't very interested in that and it was sad. Uh, and I grew up in the suburbs, largely. So it was, we had one black family in one suburb, one black family, Greg. it was like, where's Waldo? Thank Didn't you for see addressing them. these guys. So, Thanks, Greg. But I'm sorry, are we? Would you, no, you're good. Just if, oh, you, good, address thank the, you. if you just want to address board leadership. I just, I, I just want to say that I, I came to Los Angeles. I'm working in inner city schools. And I think I know something, and I don't. And nor do most of the others. We are learning on the job just like parents learn on the job. There needs to be more parent involvement in the school, more family involvement in the school, and more opportunity for kids to be directing their own learning through independent reading. And that's, I mean, I think that what we're all afraid of is that one side wants to indoctrinate the other side. And frankly, education for the most part is indoctrination when it's top down. And it can go wrong even when people have their best interests in mind, 15. and certainly I did, but I'd hate to tell you all the mistakes that I made. But I think that it's really important that we allow kids to direct their own education and to a certain extent and uh, have the support of teachers and how to do that and more independent reading and more training of parents in what's, how to help their children in the school and maybe some child care. Thank you. Campus. Welcome to you. Central Oregon. Yeah. All right, Jackie. What? Oh, a oh, little Jackie. She's amazing. Um, Esme, singer? Esme? And then, in case you guys are wondering, we have five more people signed up, so you guys are phenomenal. Thank you for sticking around. Um, I'm Esme Singer. I, um, I think I'm one of the few voters here who sorry, went through the K through 12 system um, all through the Bend the Pine District. And I first want to say something about like bringing Jesus back in school. I respect religions and I do not care what religion you are, but I do feel it's disrespectful and alienating to, uh, to those of us who aren't Christian to say that type of thing, sorry. But um, I just wanna say while I was in this school district, I had friends and myself be discriminated against, called slurs, and so I think if anything, we need to teach more about racism and like how to be anti-racist than we ever did, <laughs> like still now. I don't think it's enough. Also, um, <laughs> I want to define like critical race theory because I feel like a lot of people don't actually know what it means. So it is the theory that racism will not fade out on its own that is ingrained into the government of this country, which should make sense to everybody because we do know that it was built on slavery. So. <laughs> All right, you guys, let her finish. You're doing Please great. Please let me talk, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is not taught to children. This is taught in colleges with classes that are specifically directed toward that or law school. So your kids are not being taught that. All right, so my argument really is just simple. If, you're, if a child is old enough to experience racism, your child is old enough to learn about it. 30. History is uncomfortable. I'm sorry, it's true, it's just, it's violent, it's horrible, but you have to learn about it. The Revolutionary War was violent because it was a war, but you're not gonna argue that you shouldn't learn about it. So, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Okay. We're on number 62, in case you're counting. Philip Tomlin, and then Sidonia Darling. Was that the little person? That's so cute. Yeah. Only he could get away with that, right? <laughs> Super cute. All right. You have the floor. Thank you. Good evening. Buenas noches. Me llamo Felipe. Estoy desde la ciudad de Albuquerque, Nuevo México. My name is Philip. I'm from the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. In New Mexico, the racial demographics are 40, roughly 47% Latino non-white and roughly 30% 
non-white, non-Latino white. What does that mean by this context of CRT? That means that the majority population can only be racist to the minority population. When I am in New Mexico, I am an oppressed individual. But when I come to Oregon, suddenly I'm an oppressor. I know racism. I lived in a society where it was rampant. And what does that equate to? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I don't really want to get into a bunch of different studies and stuff like that. This is going to be a personal research experiment. If you have a smartphone, an internet-enabled device, whoever's watching this later, please pull it out. There are roughly 91.1 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. They are, there are roughly 1.445 billion Chinese citizens. That means roughly 6.3% of the Chinese population inflicts their tyrannical rule upon 95.7% of the population. They rule through fear. Masks, virus, variants, and vaccines are instruments of fear for tyrants to control and institute unconstitutional, tyrannical measures. A, a previous speaker said that CRT, anti-racism and racial e equity education is socialist or Marxist. If you have your phone out, I challenge you to pull out your device, if you haven't yet, and go to the website cpusa.org. It is the website for the organization of the Communist Party USA. Scroll down to the bottom on the contact screen and you will see Washington DC has a link to a website. That's the Claudia Jones School of Political Education. Go to their Twitter account and see that they spread communist propaganda. Every one of these educational measures is designed by communists to divide this country. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Hi there. Thanks for staying. Bill is up after you. Um, my name is Sidonia Darling. I was not planning on speaking, okay. so Can please I put your bear with me. Um, I'm here to stand um, and back the strong voices um, and stand up for our children. Um, I haven't, I know there's been a lot of strong voices and I feel like they need to be backed. So that's why I'm talking. <laughs> um, I feel hopeless and anxious as ever, as I know many of my friends do. I have a fourth and sixth grader in the public school system since kindergarten. I am an educated individual. I hold a master's in teaching as well, although I haven't been in the classroom for many years, although I have subbed. Um, my, my question is, is who are we protecting? Everywhere we go, we are open. 99% of the people, no masks. Who are we protecting? Why is it put on our school community to protect when everywhere we go, majority are unmasked, living life, hugging, mingling? So why is it my children's back and a teacher's back if to, to protect? If I can go into a luncheon at the River House hosting 200 people, which I did, a week ago and saw only one person with a mask. Why do my children need to be masked? Who is it to say that you're not hurting my child by first forcing all children to wear a mask? Did you care before COVID? Did you notice the cram lunch tables before? Did you care when half your child's classroom was missing out sick before COVID? It is not just a piece of cloth. It creates headaches. It is hot and uncomfortable. It creates rashes and more. I'm disappointed at the turnout here. It's summer, people doing life. Majority of parents are not heard. I heard that there was a response that parents are being heard and we don't need to have a survey. We need a survey. We need a mass survey. <coughs> Sorry, let's repeat. Since kids do not go to school until February last year, my kids are okay not wearing a mask during the winter, but once temperatures heated up, um, masking and learning are not cohesive. Can you feel the warmth in this own room right now? My pediatrician, I now question my pediatrician's um, responsibility to my child's health. I cannot trust her. If your mask works, wear it. If you want to protect your child, wear one. If you want to vax, vax. I am not anti-vax. My kids are vaccinated with the, with the regular standard regimen. There is a difference between classic conditioning and the true, true data. What is the data? What is the truth? We need to guide our children. There's a bigger picture out there, and we need to stand up and unmask our children. Thank you. Thank you. Are you Bill? Bill's been right here in the front the whole time. Hi, my name's Bill Colton. I would like to have my name on the next meeting. All right? Give so me your can email. you put an asterisk I'll on put, that? I'll put a little post at my office okay, and I'll be good. like, Bill. And more importantly, I think that we should get back to the basics as far as uh, instruction in the schools. And the last time I looked, two plus two equals four. 
Bill, that was so succinct. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Okay. Sherry or Shelly Baker? Another front rower. You guys are troopers. Okay, the last person after you is Nicole. So thanks, everybody. I wasn't planning on speaking. I think you guys have heard from me enough. But I do have some things to say. <laughs> um, first of all, I find it really surprising and almost indicative to where we're at that we didn't open today with the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. What an oversight. And I hope that that's reinstated next time. Secondly, I'm proud to be an American. I love this country. I am blessed that I was born here. And I come from a long line of military veterans. No one is saying that we're perfect. This country is not perfect because it is made up of imperfect men and women. And yes, I say men and women. It is made of imperfect men, sinful men and women. We don't have a racial issue, we have a heart issue. Yes. I teach my children that everyone, no matter their political beliefs, their race, where they came from, anything that differentiates us, they are all made in God's image. And they are to be treated with respect, kindness, and love, no matter what. That's what I teach in my home. That's what we should teach in schools. No one is saying we don't need to teach U.S. history, civil rights, the ills of slavery, and all of the ills that America has done. No one is saying that. What we are saying is please do not pit our children against each other based upon what they look like. Yes. Lastly, I have 20 seconds. Public health has turned into politics. That is why we do not trust the public health anymore. They used to have a great reputation where we can trust them. They still have not come out with an end game. What is the end game when it comes to masks? No one is telling us until when. No one has answered that question, and that's a disservice to us parents. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Okay, Nicole, Nicole. Okay, wait, 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 hold on. Sorry. Wait, did you speak already? I did. Are you on here twice? Wait, no, no, wait. We're gonna, we'll do it after just the sake of the process and time. Do you like how I got between you yeah, and Mike? Yeah. She's walking yeah. me. Yeah. I can speak later. Yeah. I'm done. Afterward, we can do a yeah. rally outside I'll if you guys want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. On that note, I'm gonna kick it back to Melissa and Marcus and thank our board members who were able to be here tonight, Dr. Cook, Dr. Nordquist, and all of you are amazing, so thank you for sticking this out, you're awesome. It's been the, let's make sure that one's on. Is that mic on? First and foremost, thank everyone for coming out, we appreciate it very, very much. Um, I'm getting ready to get on the plane and, and bury my fifth family member from COVID. I'm getting on the plane to bury my fifth family member from COVID. I'm getting ready to bury guys, my respectful. fifth family member from hey, COVID. Hey, you guys, I love not you guys. appropriate. Thank you. Love you guys. Not appropriate. All right, we're going to wrap up with Melissa. Marcus, thank you, and uh, we condolences from everyone here. Really quickly, we just want to thank you again for coming out tonight. It's been incredible to see so many co people come out. You guys, To please. spend the time that they have tonight to go into extra minutes of your evening. And so, again, we want to thank you. Um, we appreciate listening to you and then hope that each of you have an excellent evening and please remember that we will have another listening session in South County. We are always available by email um, and we look forward to continued conversations. Thank you. Thank you guys. Now you can do your rowdy and I will come grab you. Now you guys, let's be respectful.